Would you bow with me for a moment? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Father, that you would help us to open our minds and our hearts to what your word has to say to us. This is that sure and certain prophecy that you've given. We ask you to use it to bring forth strength in our hearts and our lives that we might walk with Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Peter has previously used the sufferings of Christ as a means of glorifying Christ. But now as we come to chapter 4, we find that Peter is challenging us to follow that example. I'm reading from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, in order that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Therefore, connects chapter 4 to all that Peter has previously said regarding his arguments. Like Paul, Peter is building a complex argument for godly living. And Peter refers again to Christ's sufferings. But in this case, he urges us to be like-minded with Christ, declaring, arm yourselves with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, in order that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Now, arm is the Greek word haplizo, and it's based on the word hoplon. A hoplon was actually a shield, a battle shield, and the uh, hoplos was a warrior. In a technical sense, it's a military term, and it means to take up arms. But in a metaphorical sense, it means to equip or furnish oneself for a specific task. And in this case, we're told to arm or furnish ourselves with the same purpose as Christ, who suffered for us in the flesh and was willing to die for us. Now, Peter has referred to this as an example, but herein we have to look more closely, for he speaks about a purpose, Christ's purpose. And so, with that purpose in mind, it is to be adopted by us. And Peter underscores that with the fact that Christ alone was sinless. We, his followers, are to be pursuing sinlessness. And so it's here that Peter's focus shifts from Christ to us, urging us to suffer for Christ and to be willing to die for him. Now, this is not a new concept. As you've read through your Gospels, you've encountered this time and again. Uh, Jesus tells us in Luke 9, 23 and 24, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. He then turns around and gives us the inverse in Matthew 10, 38 and 39, where Jesus says, He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. We're to live for Christ. We're to be willing to suffer and die for him. But that's not an end in and of itself. It's simply a part of the process. Our suffering in the flesh is 
has another purpose beyond being an example for Christ. Because it is Christ's desire that we would become like him. In verse 2, Peter argues, in order that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Now, obviously, as you read this, it becomes clear that he cannot be the sinless Christ. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We are, and the he that is spoken of here, is the suffering saint who is to be striving against sin in order that he may live according to the will of God. We need to strive against sin, and we need to battle against these sufferings so that we might take on the purpose of Christ. That purpose of Christ being that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. Only as Christ is sanctified in our hearts will he be seen in our lives. Again, we look back to that concept of making him the Lord of our lives, placing him on the throne of our hearts. And I'd like you to look with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, where Paul echoes this same theme, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, in order that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, in order that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, in order that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Christ lives within us. It is the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And it's the Holy Spirit who enables us to live for Christ. We have this treasure, Paul writes, in earthen vessels for this reason specifically. So the excellence of the power would be not of us, but of Christ. That we would recognize and we would tell the world that it is not us, but Christ in us. We see the suffering saint in verses 8, 9, and 11. He says regarding the believer, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. These are the things that come upon us because we are sojourners in this world. But we also see our victory in this passage as well. For we read in verses 10 and 11, we always carry about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus in order that the life of Jesus also may be manifested, clearly revealed in our body, and then also that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. It's to this end that Peter has admonished us, arm yourself with this same purpose. In Peter, 1 Peter 4.3, Peter speaks of the life that should be left behind. You remember that he had said, we to arm ourselves. And if Christ is sanctified in our hearts, this should be our life pattern. Verse 3, we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. We've spent enough of our lives wasted in living as the world would have us to live. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. That next to the last phrase, drinking parties, reminds me of high school. I don't know about you, but I know about me. I was in that world. And notice how Peter has shifted his focus 
from the nameless suffering servant to himself and to us. He uses the nominative plural pronoun we. We have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. There's not enough life left to spend any more time in that manner of living. And he clearly defines some of those previous lifestyles. Lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. We could throw in there backbiting, lying, jealousy, envy, and all of the other less obvious sins. But nonetheless, they have been part of our lives. Enough of that life. This is what we're being told. And we look back to Paul in Galatians 5.16, where Paul wrote, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, declarative statement, and you shall not. Shall not. It is when we allow the Spirit to rule in our lives that we are no longer living this, the life of this world. And now Peter turns his attention from the believer and this exhortation to the unbeliever. <clears throat> and his response to those, that is the unbeliever's response to those who have turned to Christ. 1 Peter 4, 4 through 6. In regard to these, that we have no longer living in these past manner of life, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason the gospel is preached also to those who are dead, in order that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Peter is a consummate realist. He would have very little in common with the feel-good preachers of today. They tell us, we're all one world, we're all one people. Oh, we have our faults, we have our problems, but none of us are any really any different or anybody better or any worse than any others. But in point of fact, Peter declares to us in verse 4 that when we receive Christ and our lives change, they, who are supposedly no different than us, will speak evil of you. You have changed, and because you have changed, they reject you just as they have rejected Christ. Think back, if you will, to John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. And Jesus told his disciples, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me, before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Unbelievers cannot understand why a believer has changed because the unbeliever still loves the old way of life. It is that simple. Their hearts are still with the world. Our hearts are with Christ. And if our hearts are with Christ, then in point of fact, our lives should be reflecting Christ. That's the change that they cannot understand. There were things that we used to do that we no longer do. There were things that we never did that we now do regularly and consistently. It's the new life in Christ. But Peter reminds us that they'll be judged for the way that they have lived because they have rejected Christ. Ultimately, it's not what we do in this world that costs us eternity. It's what we do in our hearts regarding Christ. And so he comes to verse 6 and he says, For this reason the gospel was preached, because there are believers and unbelievers. For this reason the gospel was was preached because all of us come into this world as sinners. But we have the opportunity, while in this world, to choose Christ. They will be judged because they have ultimately rejected Christ. For this reason, 
the gospel was judged. And he's pointing back to this statement in verse 5 regarding final judgment. And it's important because the gospel was given so that men would have the opportunity to receive Christ, who has taken their judgment upon himself on the cross. I would remind you again, Christ did not die for the elect. He had died for the lost. He died for sinners, and we're all sinners. And I know of no other passage that better reflects Christ's purpose than John 3, 16 through 18. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. In John, we see a person's choices, receive Christ or reject him, and the consequences of those choices. We either believe and are saved, or we do not believe and continue to be condemned. You notice that. We continue to be condemned. We came into this world condemned because we came into this world sinners. The state of the sinner does not change by not receiving Christ. He remains what he was and stands before God a condemned sinner. The sinner that receives Christ is changed because he is forgiven. The blood is applied to him. He is granted the gift of eternal life. And so Peter focuses on these who've heard the gospel and believed and died. Now remember, when Paul spoke about how significant it was that we recognize that there is a change when we receive Christ. And Peter does the same. He assures us, though they who have passed have endured physical death, and that is the curse of sin, the soul that sinneth, it shall, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Easy word, short, three letters. The soul that sins, it shall die. Believer, unbeliever, other than in the rapture, the body dies. But even though the body has died, even though we have suffered in the flesh, we live through Christ, even though the body is dead. What is the blessed hope? What are we waiting for? Think about it. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for Christ to return. And the first thing that he will do is raise up the dead believers in Christ to glorify their bodies. This is what Peter was talking about. He said, you need to understand that those who have died in Christ have never died. They're still alive. Their bodies will be raised. Then he catches us up. And so we need to keep the order in mind that those who have endured physical death because that is the consequence of sin, are even though physically dead, spiritually alive. Here that Peter looks forward, we have a total shift here. Up to this point, we have been looking at what has been and what should be. And now we're looking forward here, talking about our spiritual duty in this hostile word. And I'm reading from 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. And please note particularly this first portion. But the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. 
If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The opening phrase, the end of all things is at hand. It not only shifts our focus from the things that we have endured to all that remains to be done in the brief time that we have left. Now, you look across the sanctuary and you see a few young people and some not quite as young people and then it begins to shift and there's what they call middle-aged, which is long past for me. And then you begin to move into the senior citizens, the chronologically advanced saints, the old people, and then the older people, and the oldest people. And you see how that list changes over and over again. And the oldest people, in all likelihood, have less time left to do the things that Christ has for us than these young people here. But don't take that as an excuse, young people, not to do the things that we need to do in the short time that remains because ultimately this is all the time that we have to live for Christ. It is, as it were, our wake-up call. This is Reveille, if you will. I'm thinking of Paul's words in Romans 13, 11 through 14. And notice again the initial phrase. And do this knowing the time, being aware of the era, that it is now high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. I was saved in 1970. The fulfillment of my salvation is much nearer than when I first believed. In fact... It's about 50 years nearer. Some of you have been saved longer than I have. Yours is even more nearer. And I realize that's an abuse of the English, but nevertheless. Keep it in mind, the time is short. The time to awake out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, Let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Peter and Paul are both speaking of the imminent return of Christ. Now, when is that? Time and time again, people have set the date. They've said, it's going to be on this date. It's going to be on that date. And I've watched every one of those dates pass. And the next one that sets that date, I think you'll be able to watch that pass. I just have this idea, and it may be because of my own twisted nature, that God is never going to allow Christ to return on the day that somebody prophesies. If nothing else, he will prove them absolutely wrong. In Matthew 24, 36, Jesus said, Of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven. And in that sense, generations of believers have anticipated Christ's return, have looked forward to it with joy and celebration. And then as time has passed, have wondered, Well, when will he return? If he hasn't come back yet, when will he return? And then that slowly begins to change. Well, I guess he's not going to return in my lifetime. Who knows? And that's the reason that believers grow lax. And that's the reason that believers grow careless about the way that we live. And we need to be reminded the day is at hand. We have no guarantee that we'll see tomorrow. We have no guarantee that we will leave this sanctuary alive. Unless you're lost. Because if the rapture comes, the believers will be gone, and those who are not saved will still be here. Bye. Keep that in mind. The end is at hand. Peter admonishes us to be serious and watchful in our prayers. 
Now, I know over the years, and I'm looking back 50 years as a believer, uh, many of my prayers were quite facetious. Lord, let me, let me have a 65 GTO. Lord, let me get that new rifle. Lord, this, and Lord, that. And none of those things had anything to do with his kingdom. They had nothing to do with his church, nothing to do with his purpose. Peter says, be serious and watchful in our prayers. Now, the word serious is the Greek word sophroneo, and it means to have sound judgment and to act sensibly. Have you ever overheard someone's stupid prayer? I mean, think about it. Married man prays, Lord, let me get a date with that secretary in my office. Don't even ask. You're supposed to be faithful to your wife. Lord, let me find the money that fell out of the back of the bank truck. I, I prayed that one. Lord, let me find just one bundle of hundreds. It's stupid. Why? Because as a believer, I should return that money to the bank. Think about it. Be watchful. Have sound judgment. Be sensible in your prayers. Be watchful as to be sober-minded in control of your thought processes. You know, we've just gone through within the past year the, the rising of the uh, new apostolic something or other. I think of that because one of the things that they admonish people to do is just pray whatever comes into your mind. Do you ever think for a moment some of the scary things that come into your mind? Don't think about it. Don't reason through it. Don't search for scripture. Just pray whatever. No, if I prayed whatever, I can think of some people who drop dead. Be careful about what you pray. Don't pray irrationally. We are to be those who have put on Christ. Even in uh, Matthew 6, 5 through 7, where Christ gives us the Lord prayer, he gives guidelines. When you pray, you will not, shall not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues. On the corner of the streets, they may see be seen by men. As surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. When you shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use empty repetitions like the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Don't pray to make a spectacle of yourself. Don't repeat yourself. You know, if you listen to, uh, actually listen to what many people refer to as praying in the spirit or tongues, um, it's kind of interesting how repetitious it is. You just listen carefully. Why? Because you're not praying with watchfulness. You're not praying with a sober mind. Verse 8, Peter moves on now from our communion with God in prayer to our communion with our brethren. He writes, Above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Jesus said, Love one another as I have loved you. Peter repeated that. Others have. Have fervent love. This adjective is the Greek word ektenes. It means to stretch out or strain. If you've watched the Olympics, I think most everybody here has seen the Olympics. Have you watched the, the races? And then you see as they come around that last turn and they move toward the finish line. Have you seen how they will begin to accelerate and they begin to lean into the wind and they start to stretch out until every muscle is strained to its absolute 
limit. This is exactly what Peter is saying here. Fervent love. He's picturing a person running with taut muscles, extreme effort. Why is that effort so necessary after all? Am I not loving the brethren? I happen to find this. It's a quote by John MacArthur. Such love is sacrificial. This is love of the brethren. Not sentimental and requires a stretching of believers every spiritual muscle to love in spite of insult, injury, offense, and misunderstandings from others. It would be nice if I only had to love the brethren when they were nice, wouldn't it? Fervent love is love stretched to its uttermost limit. You know, that's not new to the old end of the New Testament. In Proverbs 10, 12, we're told hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sin. Cover that sin. Cover that insult. Cover that injury. Cover that offense. Oh, pastor, I've been offended. Suck it up. Would you rather suck it up or destroy the body? Which is it? Love covers most sin. No, wait, that's not what it says. My notes right here. Love covers all sins. What sin should we not forgive? The one that Christ didn't forgive. Verse 9, Peter exhorts us, be hospitable to one another with grumbling. Again, this is kind of a a contrast because this word, philodzenos, is literally be kind or hospitable to strangers. This is not phileo, loving the brethren. This is being hospitable to strangers. Now, this was a common practice in the Old Testament. You'll remember, I've spoken on it a number of times. Pastor Jeff has as well, and in time, I'm sure Pastor Tyler will. You took a man into your tent. You brought him under your protection. You fed him. You clothed him. You took care of him. But Peter says, to one another, to one another, do these things that you would do for a stranger to one another. Have you noticed how quick we are to apologize to a stranger when we bump into them? And how seldom we do that for people that are close to us? I mean, after all, they should know we didn't mean it, right? Getting casual. And he adds a phrase to this. Without grumbling. It's the Greek word gagasmus. Gagasmus. It's translated grumble, murmur, mutter, mumble. But it's rarely used as an overt, open statement of discontent. It's more frequently used to describe those indistinct sounds of displeasure we refer to as muttering under one's breath. Honey, why didn't you turn out the light? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll turn out the light. Oh, you could have turned out the light just as easily as I turned out the light. Why do you want me to turn out the light? You were there first. You know, we don't do that, do we? Do we? My my daughter Sarah was a champion mumbler. All the way down the hallway from the living room to her bedroom. Going through the door and even as she slammed the door. The problem was that I was right behind her down the hallway and I opened the door and then we discussed mumbling. In verses 10 and 11, Peter writes, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, Let him speak as the oracles, the very words of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability that God supplies, that in all things 
God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, that thoughts reflected in Paul, you know the passage. I think particularly of Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, which is specifically about ministry gifts. Paul wrote, having then again gifts differing according to the grace that has been given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, who exhorts in exhorting, exhortation, he who gives with, with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. If God's given you the gift, use the gift. Use the gift. We're reminded our spiritual gifts are, in fact, gifts. They're unearned. They're undeserved. They are given to us to be used for God's glory. The Holy Spirit chooses which gift or gifts we should receive according to his wisdom. But as stewards of these gifts, we choose whether or not we will be faithful. But the end is at hand. Beyond that principle of stewardship, there's also the issue of sacrifice. Are we willing to use our gifts even if we might suffer for it? in order to bring glory to God through Jesus Christ? Well, there's no point being nice to them. They're just going to be nasty to you anyway. I've been told that, and my answer is, but I would like to be biblical. Because when you're nice to them who are not nice to you, you heap fiery coals upon their head. Oh, no, that's not supposed to be a reason, is it? No. It is to bring glory to God. Here we come to the culmination of Peter's arguments for suffering for Christ. It's not for our glory. It's for his glory. And so Peter admonishes us, sanctify, set aside, aside the Lord God in your hearts so that in all things, and this is Peter's conclusion, in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Our suffering trains us. It trains us. It helps us to grow. And it's all not for us. It's for him. It's to God's glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. And we do pray that we would give heed to Peter's words, that we would be reminded that we will suffer in this world, but to see suffering in its true context, that it strengthens us. It enables us to show Christ in our lives. It brings glory to God who has changed our lives. So, Father, we ask us in all things, to help us in that time that remains, knowing that the end is at hand, to use these last moments wisely. In Jesus' name, amen.